praise team for that great reminder of some of the things that we have in Christ. It's great to be a Christian, isn't it? I hope you are. I hope if not, by the end of the day, you will be. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? We're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'll be reading beginning in verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overwhelmed me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. What a wonderful passage of scripture God has given us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the day and the worship that we've had together already. We pray now that as we worship you by listening to your word, you will help us to truly be those who hear. Pray that it will be ministered to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you will ensure that no sin on the part of the speaker gets in the way. Pray for your forgiveness, for your mercy. We pray, Father, for those who do not have the privilege together today. We always, they're always on our mind as we get together in a beautiful place with lovely people. Think of those who are persecuted around the world, living perhaps in a jail cell today, some other very tenuous place where their faith has cost them greatly. We pray for them. We lift them up. We pray that they will not only know that there are others praying for them, but we pray that they will know your presence as never before. That as the things of this world kind of fade away, that they will be seeing the realities of eternity. Reminded how you say that the things that are seen are temporal. It's the things that are unseen that are real. And so, Father, we pray that you'll get our concentration in the right place to benefit us, not just for today and tomorrow, but forever. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated, and please turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1, if you're not already there. 1 Timothy 1. I attended a school called Biola University in the uh, mid-60s just after it had moved out of Los Angeles into La Mirada, California, which is right between Orange County and L.A. County, in its downtown location where the nursing students were still held at that time, there, it, it, was, it had been housed in a very high building, uh, a skyscraper at the time, although it has since been dwarfed by some of the new buildings in Los Angeles. But at the top of that great building, there was a sign that said, Jesus saves, big bold letters. You can imagine the jokes that went around about that, right? Jesus saves what? Green, green stamps? Jesus saves where? Great Western? These were some of the jokes that we heard often when we came around that sign. Well, here we have in our text today a wonderful answer to the question, Jesus saves what? And Jesus saves who? Jesus saves sinners. That's what the sign is all about, and that's what this passage is all about, and that is a, re a message that is always relevant. But the false teachers in Ephesus, mentioned in verses 3 through 11, didn't get that. To them, salvation was about Jesus plus good works, Jesus plus the traditions of the Jewish law, Jesus plus something that they could do. Having denied that, Peter now does what every good teacher does. He gave a real-life example. And in this case, the real-life example is himself. His life 
as dramatically as perhaps, probably any in history proves that Jesus indeed saves. But there's a lot of inspiring nuance that goes along with what Paul's going to describe here. And so over the next couple of weeks, we want to look at this great passage using kind of the outline, the source of salvation, the recipients, the mission, and the message. My prayer is that we'll see the beauty of our Savior in a whole new and refreshing way as we go through this passage. And my prayer especially is that if you don't know him yet, that you will come to know him. The source of salvation, what is that? Well, beloved, salvation originates only in one place, and that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nowhere else. Paul, twice in this passage, says that he received mercy. He didn't ask for it. He didn't beg for it. He didn't even know it was coming. But boy, did he get it right between the eyes on the Damascus Road, did he not? He received mercy, and it never was far from his mind that God took the initiative. He says in verse 12, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. In verse 12, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Lord is a translation of the Old Testament word Yahweh or Jehovah. It speaks of God. In the New Testament, when you've come across that word, it is used both of Jesus and of God the Father because both are God. In verse 12 here, it is used of Jesus. In verse 14, he speaks of the grace of Yahweh, emphasis there on the Father, that is exhibited, revealed, and implemented through Jesus. This beautifully depicts the work of the whole Trinity in our salvation. In his doxology in verse 17, Paul praises the only God because salvation originates with God. That's where it all starts. The law is not the source of salvation. You and I and the faith that we think we have is not the source of salvation. That would require perfection. To have the law be the source of salvation or us. God says in Romans 3, no one is righteous, no, not one. If you want salvation by law, Paul will tell you how in Galatians chapter 3. He says in Galatians 3 verse 10, for all who rely on the works of the law, in other words, their goodness. What about them? They are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. The key word there is all. You want to get saved by the law? You want the law to be your salvation? Great. All you have to do is be perfect. I don't think any of us would claim that, right? You ever tell a lie anywhere, anytime, anyway? Like today? Yesterday? How long has it been? Ever... Be so angry with somebody that you wish they just disappear from the face of the earth? Ever, you know, covet and desire your neighbor's car, your neighbor's house, your neighbor's yard, your neighbor's wife? They're all ways that we sin constantly, right? Listen, beloved, you know this. If your faith were made, was made public and if my, your thoughts, and if my thoughts were made pu public, we'd be gone in a minute, wouldn't we? It'd all be over with. God says that he looks on the heart and he knows the thoughts that we have. We must not be fooled that we can good our way to heaven. We cannot be good enough. We can never be perfect. God says all have sinned and therefore fall short of the glory of God. This is a tough message for people who know that they're better than most. And perhaps that's most of us sitting here today. They know that they are more kind, they are more loving, they're more compassionate, they care more, their failures are small. But listen, you ladies know this. If you if you got great company coming, you know, the boss is coming for dinner, and you pull out the white tablecloth and begin to put it on the table, and there's that old red wine stain that you forgot about, right? It's not good enough, is it? Well, that's just the example of our the stains that we have over the cloth of, of our life are everywhere. 
constantly being renewed. That's why the law can save no one. You, know, say, but, you say, but why, why can't I just pay for my own sins, you know? If I've got some sins, yes, I do, but, you know, if I could just pay for my own, I'd be good to go. Give me a thousand years in purgatory or something like that, and then I'll be okay. Problem is, beloved, the Bible knows nothing about a purgatory. There is no purgatory. It's something that was made up in the Middle Ages and somehow kept its existence right through the Reformation when the Reformation Heroes of the Reformation denied it because it is not in Scripture, and it is not true. The Bible says it is appointed and a man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. It's not a Reformation project. There's no purgatory. Worse yet is who our sins have offended. You know, our sins have offended an infinitely holy God. And we all know that the that the, the greater the person who is offended, the greater the offense and the greater the penalty, right? You could spit on my face. And the worst thing that might happen is I might spit back or maybe I'd even take a swing at you possibly, right? I hate to admit that, but that could happen. You spit on the face of the chief of police and you're probably going to find yourself in handcuffs laying on the ground, right? You spit on the president and you're looking at some serious jail time. The greater... The person offended, the greater the offense. And we have offended an infinitely holy being, not just once, but repeatedly. This is who we are outside of Christ. That's why I can never save myself. Thankfully, God has filled the gap that neither I nor the law can fill. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ today, and I hope you are, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that relationship did not originate with you. It originated with him. It feels like it, looks like it. You feel like you took the first steps. You were smart enough to come to faith when you heard the gospel somewhere along the line. But I can tell you, Paul knew that's not how it happened. He knew God took the first step. God always takes the first step. Salvation is of the Lord. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, listen to this, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. All those things come afterwards, the sanctification and the believing in the truth. But it starts when God, because God chose you. This truth is emphasized all the way through Scripture. In Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5, God says this, Even as he chose us before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us to adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Listen, sometimes people don't like those words, but Paul reveled in those words. That passage in Ephesians is part of a sentence that goes from all the way from verse 3 to verse 14 in that, in that passage because he got so wrapped up in everything that he has in Christ. He's been chosen. He's been adopted. He has been sanctified. He's been redeemed. He's been predestined. All because God loved him. If you're a Christian today, it's because God chose you. Paul says this in Romans chapter 8, verse 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. He, 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 all the way through that passage. He is the source of salvation. No one and nothing else could ever be. Jesus is emphatic about this. You know, Jesus taught this. Turn with me to John chapter 6. Sixth chapter of John. This is shortly after Jesus had fed the 5,000 and they came and wanted to make him king. And he said, no, what you don't need, you don't need any more food that you can get here on earth. You need the food 
that I can give you that's eternal. And they weren't interested in that. And he knew why. He says this in John 6, verse 44. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. So apart from the compelling grace of God, no one would come to Christ and say, okay, I'll come to you. You say, okay, but maybe God drew some and they refused to come. Not so. Look back in verse 37 of John 6. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Believe me, this is a closed circle. God the Father draws, and all that the Father draws come. All who come to Jesus are received by him. And all who are received by him will never be cast out. But it's a closed circle, and it starts with God choosing. Salvation is of the Lord. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And we say, yeah, see there, it's my faith that did it. But Paul goes on. He says, and this, that is the faith, is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Not a result of work so that no one may boast. No one can say, never going to be able to say in heaven, I am here because I was smart enough to accept Christ. Well, we need to, I, I, this is a doctor we don't always like, but we need to revel in it. We've been chosen by God. This, this is a priceless gift to be chosen by God. If salvation didn't originate with God, no one would ever come to him. No one. Jonah 2.9, it's pretty near the middle verse of the Bible almost, and it says this, salvation belongs to the Lord. You know when Jonah prayed that, he was in the belly of the fish, of the great fish? And when he looked around in the belly of the fish, he realized, you know what, if I'm going to get out of here, it's going to have to be because of God. I'm clearly not going to get out of here because of me. And you know what the really interesting thing is? You read through that prayer in Jonah, Jonah chapter 2, he never once asked to get out. He trusts the Lord. He realizes it's going to be God's grace and mercy that gets him out or he's not going to get out. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation belongs to him, beloved. It's his to do with as he chooses. And if you've chosen him today, you occupy an unbelievably special place in the hierarchy of people who have ever lived. But salvation originates with God and nowhere else. He has chosen those who have been saved. You know, I was in the fifth grade, and first day of school, there was, you know, pretty new blonde girl that moved into town. And there she was, sitting a couple rows in front. And I was smitten. But, you know, at that age, you don't admit it, right? You certainly don't admit that you like a girl. <laughs> Beyond that, I was so shy in those days, I couldn't have said anything to her two words if I wanted to. But over a period of time, about over about a half a year, I began to check with third parties, you know, and eventually got up the nerve to send a note, wrote out something, says, hey, I like you. I don't matter what I said, something, something really poetic like that. And then I got an, a note back, and guess what? I was chosen. Let me tell you, it's wonderful to be chosen. We still never talked to each other the whole year, but I was chosen. It's great to be chosen. Now, I took some initiative in that case. With God, we're chosen because we're chosen because he loved us. It's great to be chosen. Aren't you glad you're chosen by God? Chosen by God. Being chosen by God set Paul's soul on fire. And it should do the same for us. If, if it doesn't, either we're not chosen because we haven't come to him we don't understand what we've got in him. So that's the initiation. That's the source of salvation. It's God. No one else, nowhere else. How about the recipients of salvation? The recipients. Who can be saved? 
who could be among the chosen of God. Well, that's where Paul goes into his personal testimony. It says in verse 16, But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example. Paul's saying, listen, I know, I know what I am. God has... God saved me to be an example, an example of what? That he can save anybody because I'm the foremost of sinners. I know that. I realize who I am. And God saved me, and if God can save me, God can save anyone. I'm exhibit one that Christ can save anybody. There's no, nobody too bad. But the grace of God cannot cover them. So Paul is, is an example of those who can be saved even though, though they're the greatest of sinners. But you know what? Paul is also another example, and we need to see this. It's in Philippians 3. So turn over there with me to Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians 3, Paul shows how he is also an example of those who are the best of the best, who still need to be saved, and God can save those as well. Look at what he says in Philippians 3, beginning in verse 4. Philippians 3, verse 4. He says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day in accordance with the law of the people of Israel, the chosen people of the tribe of Benjamin, where the first king came from, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As to the law, Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul is saying, listen, in one sense, I am the best person I knew. I could, I'd been willing to put my life up against anybody's, and I would have won. That's how good I was. If the law could do it, I would have been in. It wasn't perfect. But he knew that he kept the law better than anybody that he was around. He knew he had greater zeal for God than anybody else he knew. But look what he says in the verses that follow. Verse 7. But whatever gain I had, and he's just listed all of it. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own. Beloved, you don't want to stand in heaven one day with just your own righteousness. Believe me, you don't. I didn't want to have just the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith. This is really a staggering passage because Paul is saying here, using accounting terms, he's saying, I got, here's the ledger of my life. And he's saying to get Christ, in order to get Christ, in order to know Christ, remember what John said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have said. You've got to know Jesus if you're going to have eternal life. Paul says, in order to know Jesus, in order to know Christ, in order to be in him, here's what I had to do. I had to take all of my goodness that was on the asset side of my ledger, and I ripped it out. So whatever goodness you're counting on this morning, you need to rip it out. But he didn't just say, I ripped it out and then I threw it away. He says, I took the righteousness that was mine, I ripped it out, and then I put it over here on the debit side of the ledger. I counted it as something that was a loss to me. All those wonderful things I did, all that schooling I got at the feet of Gamaliel, all of the wonderful things that I had done, giving to the temple and doing all these things and now trying to persecute the church in God's name. All these things that I had done in order to make, ingratiate myself to God, I counted them as loss. Why? Because they were keeping me from Christ. I was counting on the wrong things. 
They weren't just a negative that I could throw, uh, 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 something that I could throw away. They were a negative that were turning my mind was t- were turning my mind in the wrong direction. I needed Christ's perfect righteousness, and when I thought I had some of my own, I didn't realize I needed His. Listen, nobody will ever come to Christ if they don't think they need Him. Beloved, you need Him. We all need Him. And so the message of Philippians 3 is no one is good enough not to need to be saved by grace through faith so that they receive the righteousness of Christ instead of the righteousness of themselves. Here's a man on his deathbed. His pastor came to visit him because he knew the time was short. And the man looked up, he saw the pastor, and he said, Pastor, don't tell me that I need Christ as Savior. I know why you're here. He said, I do not need the mercy and the grace of God. I don't. I've lived my life one way, and I'm going to die the same way. He said, I am willing to face God face to face just like I am. And he went on and enumerated all the things that he had done. He had been involved in an, in an orphanage, an orphan's home near his house. And he had been faithful in helping them out financially and with work. He'd been faithful in his church. He'd been faithful to his family and to his wife. There was no, in his mind, there was no blemish on his record. He was a wonderful man, had an impeccable record. So he didn't feel like he needed Christ, but I, I, I guarantee you, beloved, he was, he was less than a minute in the presence of an infinitely holy God, and he realized all of his goodness was, was shot through with the rubbish of selfishness. And he couldn't possibly stand before God other than as someone who was far short of the glory of God. Paul's, God's test case to show that even the best people need God's grace. You'll know the minute you die that you're not the first one to be good enough to match the perfect holiness of God. So Paul is an example of even the best of the best need Christ. But in our passage, back in 1 Timothy Chapter 1, he's making the point on the other side because Paul is an interesting individual who actually represents both sides of the spectrum. First part of his life was lived for himself, lived in holiness as the best he knew how to do it, better than anybody that he knew. But that very holiness, that very desire to please God led him because he rejected Christ down a destructive road. And so he says in verse 13, 1 Timothy 1, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Paul's attempts to keep and to honor God had led him to be, in his words, the foremost of sinners. He He calls himself, first of all, a blasphemer. How is it that he was a blasphemer? He didn't speak against God. Oh, but he did because he spoke against Christ. And you see, to speak against Christ is to speak against God. God the Father and God the Son are inextricably linked, and you can't have God the Father without God the Son. And the world is full of people who think they can. Paul thought he could. He wasn't against God, and he wasn't against God the Father. He had a certain love for God the Father. He had a certain desire to please God the Father, but he hated Christ. He came to realize that that made him a blasphemer. He spoke against God, and so he realized he had disobeyed all of the first half of the Ten Commandments because they all relate to God, and Jesus being God, they all meant that Paul was a blasphemer. And if you think Jesus is anything less than God, beloved, you're in the same boat. You're in the same boat. Paul says, secondly, that he was a persecutor. That's the second half of the law, the law that relates to our relationships with other people. And Paul knew himself now to be a persecutor. He was a sadistic murderer is what he was. You say, well, that's kind of strong language. Sadistic, yeah. See the words insolent oppressor? Verse 13, insolent oppressor. It's the word hubristes. We get our word hubris from it. But the actual meaning of the word, the Greek meaning, in that day and time meant 
someone who mistreats others for pleasure. He was a sadist. He loved to see Christians persecuted. It gave him joy to see Christians persecuted. He wanted to see them persecuted. Not a pretty picture, is it? He sees himself as the worst sinner ever. We might ask today, what, worse than Hitler? Worse than Stalin? Worse than bin Laden? Of course, in terms of actual numbers, no. But God looks on the heart. And Paul realized when God looks at his heart, he was as bad as it gets. And so he says in verse 16, but I received mercy. Underline that word in your Bibles. In the, in the two places it's found, Paul knew he received mercy. He didn't do anything to get this. He didn't deserve what he got. He didn't deserve for God to knock him off of his horse on the way to Damascus with the great light and shine into his life. He didn't deserve any of that. He wouldn't have had it if God hadn't taken the initiative because God is the source of salvation. But God did take the initiative. And Paul is saying if Christ could save me, if he could save me, the worst of all sinners, then he could save anyone. No one is too bad. The Bible is full of this, is it not? Moses was a murderer that God saved and used for his purposes. Matthew, and that little guy who climbed up in the tree, Zacchaeus, they were tax collectors and cheats and traitors to their own country, and God saved them and used them in his service. God saved David, who was an adulterer and a murderer and tried to cover it all up. Paul was a murderer. But in our hearts, we're all murderers, aren't we? And God can save us. But we have to come to him. We have to acknowledge him. We have to credit the death that Jesus died in our place. Look to him. Despite the ugliness of our hearts, there is a Savior who is waiting to free us, to marry us, literally, according to the Bible. Take us to himself. No one is too bad, but the grace of God can't save them, and no one is too good not to need salvation. Everyone. So who can be saved? Anybody. God's grace overwhelms all comers. Okay, you say, but now if you've been listening closely, you've got a $64,000 question, right? And the $64,000 question is, okay, God's grace is sufficient for anybody. Great, but what if I'm not chosen? He's told me I can only be saved if I'm chosen. What if I'm not chosen? Beloved, that's where we have to see that the Bible presents two sides to this wonderful coin of salvation. It teaches us that God chooses those who will be saved. It also teaches us that anyone who comes may be saved. It teaches us both. It teaches us a complementarian truth. It's like the two railroad tracks running down in the distance. You see them and you can see they're apart and they never meet as far as a human being is concerned. But out there in the eternity they meet and the, and the free will of man and the sovereignty of God meet somewhere out there in a way that I can't totally explain to you today. I'd like to be able to, but I can't because I can't understand. But I know this, it means God is greater than me and I love that. And I know that while I can't do anything about the sovereignty of God, I can very well do something about whether I choose him. Right? And it's very clear in the Bible that the responsibility for whether we choose him is on us. Jesus knew all about election. Jesus knew all about God's choosing, as we just saw in the passages we've read, when he said, no one can come to me except the Father draws him. Jesus knew all about that truth. But Jesus also said this in Luke 9, 23, if Anyone will come after me. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Anybody can come. While the price is great, the reward is even greater. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Jesus, Jesus' invitation is clear and it's inclusive in John 5, 24. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Revelation 3, verse 20, Jesus is picturing us standing at the heart's door. 
of every person and saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him. Listen, beloved, the invitation is all. Never mistake that. <clears throat> Jesus' invitation is to all to come to him. Peter's great sermon in Acts 4, 2, verse 21, he says, Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The choice is yours. If it weren't if you're not chosen, then you wouldn't be worried about it. Spurgeon said it this way. It's a beautiful depiction. He said, some say it is unfair for God to choose some and leave others. Now I'll ask you one more question. If there is there any of you here, who wishes to be holy, who wishes to be regenerate, to leave off sin and to walk in holiness. Yes, there is, says someone. I do. Then God has chosen you, Spurgeon says. But another says, no, I don't want to be holy. I don't want to give up my lust. I don't want to give up my vices. So you have no complaint by your own confession. You don't want to be chosen. That's brilliantly stated. I can't do any better than that. You want to be chosen, you are chosen. So are you in Christ this morning? I mean, do you know him? Have you chosen him? And those of us who have been chosen by Christ, must we must together revel in the fact that we belong to him. It should be part of what we do anytime we gather together. If you're not in Christ this morning, if you don't know him, we join Paul. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, we implore you, literally, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. It's your choice. But we'll join him in begging you to come to Christ. Donald Barnhouse, the great preacher, 10th Avenue Presbyterian in Philadelphia for so many years, he used to teach God's election this way. He would say, imagine a cross like the one Jesus died on, only it's so large that it has a door in it. Over the door are these words from Revelation 21, 17. Whoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. He says these words represent the free universal offer of salvation by grace through faith. For the one who enters on the other side of the door is a happy surprise. For from the inside, anyone glancing back can see the words written above the door from Ephesians 1.4. Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Those who will make the decision for Christ find that God made the decision for them in eternity past. That could be you this morning. Your choice. But know this. Jesus says in John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You'll never be able to say, I didn't have a choice. Jesus says that you do. In the words of Revelation 22, verse 17, the Spirit, God, and the bride, those who are already saved, they all say, come. And we this morning say, come. Come to Christ. As you sit where you are, come to Jesus. Acknowledge in a heartfelt prayer the fact that you know you're a sinner who cannot save yourself. Jesus has died to save you, and you want to give your life to him. Come, come, come this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for this reminder. What a privileged position to be chosen by God, but also what the human responsibility is that we choose you. And so I pray right now this morning, Father, for those who do not know you where they sit here, Will you please open their heart to you right now? 
As we take a few minutes of quiet time, I'm just going to ask that you, if you know Jesus, thank him for choosing you before the foundation of the world. If you don't know him, would you write at this, in this moment, open your heart to him. Confess yourself a sinner. Ask him to save you, and he will. I'm sure that none of us here this morning would want to see our whole life, including our thoughts as well as our deeds and our words, spread out on a table before you. Thank you that if we are in Christ, it is only the righteousness of Christ that will be spread out in our name. That's why Paul was willing to give up all of his goodness, because he got the righteousness of Christ in exchange. Pray for those who this morning have even now turned their life over to you. Give them the courage, Father, to come and allow us to give them some literature to read and to further know what it means to be a Christ follower. Thank you for all that you've done on our behalf that we never deserved, never could have deserved. Thank you for calling us, for choosing us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.